life as a cheerleader for evolution, tearing down the foundations of Christendom and erecting in its place a syncretistic blend of Eastern religion, shamanism, and a do-it-yourself, drug-fueled enlightenment. Our Father, who art in the cellular heaven within, hallowed be thy name, from whose loins we have sprung. And a primary tool for advancing this New Age gospel? You got it. Rock and roll. One makes you larger. Speaking of the psychedelic bands that dotted the 60s landscape, groups that increasingly embraced his occult views, Leary declared, I rejoice to see our culture being taken over by joyful young messiahs who dispel our fears and charm us back into the pagan dance of harmony. In an essay Leary wrote at the time, he actually spoke of God becoming incarnate in a particular band. He or she, he said, has come back as the four-sided Mandela, the Beatles, the means by which to spread the new gospel, music, the sacrament, drugs. And in what became the virtual model for our opening vignette, John Lennon became so enamored with Leary's thought and practice, he used his translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead in the lyrics for the 1966 release, Tomorrow Never Knows. Observing the impact of both this song and a year later, the groundbreaking Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, Leary once again extolled the power of music to affect social change by sparking a form of religious awakening. First, Leary said, you started with rock and roll and then you add psychedelic drugs. Millions of kids turned on pharmacologically, listening to stoned out electronic music designed specifically for the suggestible psychedelicized nervous system by stoned out long haired minstrels. This combination of electrical pharmacological expansion is the most powerful brainwashing device our planet has ever known. An instrument for evangelic education. Propaganda that few people over the age of 30 can comprehend. They're laying down a new revelation. The journey to the East. And the East is precisely where the brainwashed multitudes found themselves. The Beatles, the Stones, and the Beach Boys, among many other rock stars, followed the same trajectory described by George Harrison. When I was younger, with the after effects of the LSD that opened something up inside me in 1966, a flood of other thoughts came into my head which led me to the yogis. Having embraced Krishna consciousness, Harrison purposely used his music, as Leary described it, for evangelic education. In a 1982 interview with the ex-Beatle, Vedic scholar Mukanda Goswami observed, I don't think it's possible to calculate just how many people were turned on to Krishna consciousness by your song, My Sweet Lord. My sweet Lord. And Harrison replied, my idea in My Sweet Lord, because it sounded like a pop song, was to sneak up on them a bit. The point was to have people not offended by Hallelujah. And by the time it gets to Hare Krishna, they're already hooked, and their foot's tapping, and they're already singing along, to lull them into a sense of false security. And, as in our opening piece, multitudes of fans were and are, quote, snuck up on, not just by this song, but through an avalanche of artists and anthems extolling the virtues of everything from reefer to reincarnation, new age spirituality to hardcore Satanism. And while few are led into full-blown devotion, many of the distinctives of occult thought have gained more than a foothold in the thinking of most Westerners. Among them, the denial of either Christ's divinity or his uniqueness. 
the mockery or trivialization of Christian faith and symbols, the embrace of pagan practices like ritual cutting, piercing, and tattooing, as well as the use of drugs, trance states, and occult customs and iconography. And, perhaps most significantly, the proliferation of the distinctly Eastern and occult notion that God is an impersonal force that lives in everything and everyone so that values and morality are relative to the individual and therefore with no absolute standard of righteousness there can be no ultimate judgment no heaven or hell imagine there's no heaven John Lennon's most famous song is among the few truly universal and instantly recognizable anthems that rock has produced. John Lennon recorded Imagine on a Thursday. The only song that has been broadcast to most of the world via the United Nations and in perhaps the most surreal performance of all, the closing ceremony of the 1996 Summer Olympics. Not only is the song fundamentally communistic, not only does it hold forth the unattainable and ultimately a cult notion of a man-made utopia, but by denying the existence of heaven, hell, and finally even God, Lenin, and apparently much of the world, seeks to deny the one thing that holds tyrants in check and that guarantees individual human freedom and dignity. What Lenin has, quote, imagined would be nothing less than hell on earth. We could spend days examining the vast panorama of occult thought and practice that has been mainstreamed through the contemporary music culture. But let's continue notes from the underground by taking just a few snapshots of some of the more crucial collusions between rock and the satanic. We'll see that David Bowie was more right than probably he ever imagined when he stated, Rock has always been the devil's music. I believe that it's dangerous. It could well bring about a very evil feeling in the West, a dark era. I feel that we're only heralding something even darker than ourselves. It's been well said that a person is known by the company he or she keeps. Well, in the world of rock and roll, there's one guy who pops up so often, you'd think he'd invented the backbeat. The Beatles featured him, along with Aldous Huxley and four Hindu masters, on the cover of their Sgt. Pepper's album. The photo montage was made up of what they called people we like and admire and our heroes. Their choice was a significant one. Aleister Crowley is generally considered to be the most important and influential occultist of the 20th century. Clever, well-educated, and a prolific writer, Crowley was a walking encyclopedia of occult thought and practice. Dubbed the wickedest man in the world by the British press, Crowley preferred his own pseudonym, The Great Beast 666. In August of 1914, the World Magazine published an account of some of the semi-public ceremonies Crowley held in London. Journalist Harry Kemp attended one such ritual and noted, then came the slow, monotonous chant of the high priest. There is no good 